Read to Lead podcast, episode nine. Hi, this is Dan Miller from 48days.com, and you're listening to my good friend Jeff Brown on the Read to Lead podcast. If you look at the first iPod, the first iPhone, they're kind of funny by today's standards because of their lack of certain features. That stuff usually comes later for Apple. Welcome to the Read to Lead podcast with Jeff Brown. Jeff believes that if you desire to achieve true success in business and in life, then consistent and intentional reading is a must. The Read to Lead podcast will not only help you narrow this ever important reading list, but also bring you key insights and valuable feedback from some of today's most successful and inspiring authors. And now, here's Jeff. Thanks for downloading the Read to Lead podcast. I am Jeff, and this podcast is dedicated to one of my passions, and I assume one of yours as well. If not, I hope it soon will be. That, of course, is reading. My goal is to help you develop a more intentional and consistent reading habit, in part because I believe that reading is essential to your success in both business and and in life. Now, each week, as you may know, we sit down with another successful and inspiring nonfiction author, and we talk about not only their latest book, but also their thoughts on leadership, personal development, marketing, career, business, entrepreneurship, and a whole lot more. In this episode, we'll be hearing from Ken Siegel, author of the book Insanely Simple, The Obsession That Drives Apple's Success. Ken spent a couple of decades working right alongside Steve Jobs, first at Next and then at Apple working on some of their most successful advertising campaigns. It's a fascinating conversation, and I am glad you're here for it. First, we'll check in with our sponsor. That is Audible. Now, the deal I'm about to share with you is not available on Audible's website. You have to go to this special URL to get it. That URL is readtoleadpodcast.com slash Audible. Now, the deal I'm talking about is a free 30-day trial of Audible and your first book, is downloadable for free. And I recommend this week, Insanely Simple, from our guest, Ken Siegel. Again, it's readtoleadpodcast.com slash audible for your free 30-day trial and your first download absolutely free. Ken Siegel is a former agency creative director and consultant for Apple and at uh, various times in his career played a lead role in the marketing of Intel, Dell, and IBM. Uh, He is a writer, speaker, and blogger, and author of the New York Times best-selling book, Insanely Simple, The Obsession That Drives Apple's Success. And he's our guest today. Ken, welcome to the Read to Lead podcast. Well, thank you. I'm uh, very honored to be here. Well, first, uh, what I consider to be the elephant in the room, I know you've seen it. What was your impression of the new Steve Jobs film that just came out? Well, I actually just saw it the other day, and I may be in the minority on this one, but I really enjoyed it. And I didn't think I was going to. Um, My feeling is that an awful lot of people, especially when it comes to the topic of Apple, you know, really scrutinize and complain and criticize. And I took it for what it is, I think, which is a movie. And people shouldn't get so upset about it. Um, Ashton Kutcher did a great job of capturing the way Steve speaks and acts. Um, So I think... That was really, really good. And I have to tell you, as a guy who sat in the room with Steve Jobs many times, I had at times that feeling like I was there again with him. I mean, his his portrayal was that good. Wow. You can quibble with a lot of things about the movie. I mean, you have to compress his life into into two hours, and that's a pretty tough thing to do. So there are some big parts missing. And the guy who wrote it uh, is a first timer. Um, I think the writing was a bit weak at parts. But I think if you're just into the the fun of it and seeing a movie that's entertaining and, uh, you know, it gives you an insight as to, uh, you know, a little bit about what went on behind the scenes, I think it's a good thing. I would also point out that probably for 99% of the people in the world, Apple is just a big company that was run by this sort of, you know, madman or whatever his press, you know, made him out to be. But they don't really know the story. And I think even though there are very broad strokes and major pieces are missing, I think if you see the movie – you do come away with a feeling like, wow, I didn't know all that went on, you know, all the intrigue of being pushed out of the company and coming back and all that kind of thing. So I think for the large, you know, masses of people who might see the movie, it'll be somewhat uh, informational, you know, although that's not what the movie is designed to be. It's designed to be a movie. It's, it's about being entertaining. And if you're an 
an Apple kind of person, if you're interested in, in the things that have happened uh, with Apple and Steve Jobs, it's a fun two hours. Well, uh, for a discussion about this obsession of Apple's uh, simplicity, it's important that we lay the groundwork here at the beginning to to understand how Apple defines simplicity. So how, how would you define it in Apple's behalf? Well, I wrote my book because I had observed this behavior of Steve Jobs over many years. And um, it is sort of a personal interpretation. It was my feeling that Steve had this sort of filter that he he applied to everything. And whether it was a, a product or the design of a product or the interface or the advertising or setting up the Apple stores or any of those things, there always seemed to be this thing about being easy to understand, communicate quickly, don't make people work too hard to get your point, that kind of thing. And he, he applied that in so many different ways that um, that inspired me to write the book because I thought he demonstrated the, the value and power of looking at things that way. Um, so I think for Apple, it's really sort of this lens through which they see everything and it distills things down to the point where people can very easily grasp what it is they're trying to do, whether it's a product, service, or whatever. Apple's passion for simplicity manifests itself in a lot of obvious ways. You, you see it in their products and their ads and their stores. And it's obviously a very successful strategy financially. So that begs the question, as you ask in the book, why don't more companies just copy what they do? Yeah. And that is the, uh, the million-dollar question or probably a billion-dollar question in Apple's case. Uh, I have long wondered that, and people I've worked with have wondered that. There is sort of a playbook that's out there for anyone to copy. Uh, part of it may be that Steve had a thing about hiring brilliant people, and maybe there is a real uh, skill involved in that because Steve was able to apply his famous reality distortion field when he would when he would recruit people. But he used to be very, very proud of the, the level of brilliance of people he surrounded himself with. And he said that that was one of Apple's greatest strengths was, was its people, as, as it is with any company. But he, had a, uh, he was particularly brutal about who he hired and who he kept on. You had to prove yourself constantly with him. Um, but I think it is obvious. It's funny, when I worked with Intel, they used to call these big meetings um, with all their marketing agencies they worked with. And for most of these companies, it's like hundreds of organizations they work with to, to take care of various things that they do. And um, they hold up Apple as an example. And I remember in one particular meeting, this person inside Intel who was leading the, the meeting said, everyone should look at what Apple does when they introduce a new product. Um, the moment Steve was done on stage. And when he, when he walked off stage, you'd walk out of the, the convention center and all these posters would be up that weren't there when you walked in. And then you'd walk out on the street and all the billboards and bus shelters and things like that would have all these posters that weren't there before. And then you'd go to their website and there would be uh, all this stuff that, that fit perfectly with, with all that other stuff. And then you'd turn on the TV or the radio and you'd have the commercials that tied into all of it. Um, and then you go, in, of course, to the Apple store where all the posters there had changed. Yeah. Um, it's really kind of remarkable, but it's not hard to observe that and say, hey, that works pretty well. Why can't we do it? <laughs> so um, <laughs> I think it's, you know, it is a mystery. And I think the answer is that it takes a lot of focus and determination to make things like that happen. And it's kind of depressing in a way that so many companies are unable to maintain that kind of focus before things start getting too complicated. With your experience having worked with the likes of Intel and Dell and IBM and Apple, you've seen probably either end of the spectrum when it comes to meetings, where in Apple's sense, it's often very small groups, uh, very smart people getting together, and at other companies, often way more many people than necessary. But how do you balance that? For a lot of companies, I know companies I've worked for and worked with, you have to balance small groups, uh, the brain trust, uh, making decisions going forward with employees getting their feelings hurt or feeling like they've been left out of the decision-making process. How do, how do you balance that as, as a leader in a company? Well, that is a very excellent observation. And it is one of the things that uh, I struggle with when I talk to people. Um, I don't want to be I don't want to oversimplify things and say, hey, just do this and you can be a big success. I think every company is unique 
um, and its culture requires a certain way of working. And you don't want to uh, shut people out of the process if they have something valuable to contribute. So my observation with Steve Jobs was that he was very uh, serious about only the right people being in a meeting. I, th I think there is uh, a good reason for everyone to take that attitude is just to think about things that maybe you've accepted over the years because that's just the way things are around here or something like that. Mm. Um, Steve was really, really good at managing meetings like that. He didn't want anyone there who might not be necessary. Now, of course, the trick is making sure that you don't shut someone out who has a really good idea. <laughs> so um, it is sort of a double-edged sword and you got to be smart about it. Um, you don't want to have a hundred opinions uh, you know, surrounding your project, but at the same time, there are people with something good to add and you want to make sure that they, they are able to participate. So you need to sort of put together a, a process by which the right people can participate. Um, and that is probably not the process that's in effect in a lot of places today, because as you mentioned, I worked at these bigger, more complicated companies and you would just have endless meeting after meeting uh, with uh, levels of approval, it's just not necessary. Um, you don't necessarily need to get the CEO involved in everything to move it along quickly like we did with Apple. That was an unusual case where Steve wanted to be involved in all those things. But there's somebody, there's a decision maker who needs to control the process more and be more involved in the process. You don't have endless meetings and endless levels of approval because it's the classic, you know, uh, decision by committee kind of a thing where too many people involved in decisions or product development or uh, anything like that. It, it just can't help but dilute the process. So it is important to have small numbers of really smart people and a process that allows them to do their work with a minimum of, of uh, thing, people mucking it up as it goes along. I thought it was interesting that it, that it wasn't unusual for Steve to look around the room at the beginning of a meeting and, 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 and challenge someone who was there as to why they were there and then being unsatisfied with the answer, dismissing them from the meeting. Yeah, it, was, uh, it could be uncomfortable to watch, but uh, <laughs> you felt bad for someone if they got tossed from a meeting. But I think, especially around Steve, it was just considered, you know, oh, that's Steve, that's the way he works. And <laughs> You know, you might have felt bad for someone, but at the same time, you felt like, well, it's probably a good thing he did that because we don't need another opinion in the room right now. Well, share a little bit about, if you would, your thoughts on the dangers of trying to please everyone, which usually manifests itself, at least for most businesses and companies, in the form of lots and lots of choices. Yeah, you know, that's a very, very big one. And when I worked at Dell, I couldn't help but note that they had just dozens of, of models of laptops, for example, whereas Apple only has like two. You know, there's a super thin one and there's a powerful one and you pick one and then you configure it as you wish and you hit the buy button. It's pretty simple. But if you look at Dell's website and HP's is just as bad, they've got, uh, well, let's see, I can actually give you a number in my most recent inventory. Dell has 42 models of laptops and HP has 49. Um, it's astounding, really, and they're, they're spread across a ton of pages. You know, the, the kinds of names, you know, there's all kinds of model names that don't really mean anything by themselves and letters and numbers. And some of them are different screen sizes, but some of them aren't. Some of them are just like the same name with a different model number. And, you know, I have no idea what the differences are. <laughs> so <laughs> it, it does take some decoding. And um, it's one of those things that I used to ask people inside Dell, why do you do that? And you'd get pretty much the answers you'd expect about different customers have different needs and we want to give people choices and that's really important to them, et cetera, et cetera. I don't know if that's true. I mean, I really think that if Dell just made an announcement one day that we're going to, we're going to make four models of laptops instead of 42 and they're going to be really, really good. You know, we're putting a lot of R and D into these things and there's going to be something for everyone there and you can configure them as you please. I don't see why there would be any kind of revolt, why, why they would lose business. I think, if anything, people would say, wow, <laughs> Dell is finally making things easier for us. Uh, but it takes you know, incredible power for uh, uh, someone to, to do that, determination and, and the power to affect change. So it would have to come from Michael Dell. And um, 
you know, a lot of these people, that's not their priority. So they're into pleasing a lot of people. And yet, if you look at the results, that's the part again, why can't people see this? Apple makes more money than HP and Dell combined. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and that's true of their PCs, I believe, as well as the company overall. It's it's not that they are not providing choices. They're just not, they're not providing confusion <laughs> like the other ones do. And I think people love the idea that if you go into an Apple store or if you go online at apple.com, it's a pretty quick process. You don't need to anguish over details. So, and you don't also feel that, you know, remorse after you buy something, They're like, did I really do the right thing? <laughs> it's like, you know, buying a car in that, in that sense, it's uh Tough decision, and, and I don't know why more companies don't make it easier, because Apple has certainly demonstrated the value of doing that. Well, I think more companies uh, would benefit, too, with familiarizing themselves with the, the smart timeline you, you lay out in the uh, Think Motion chapter. You write about aiming unrealistically high and to never stop moving. What, what are some of the ways that, that Apple demonstrates those principles? Well, Apple, interestingly, when it comes out with a revolutionary product, they, they are revolutionary because of the concept of them, but they don't cram them full of, of features. If you look at the, well, the first iMac even, uh, the first iPod, the first iPhone, they're kind of funny by today's standards because of uh, their lack of certain features or certain design sense. That stuff usually comes later for Apple. They, they don't aim unrealistically high. They're, the concept of the product is, is lofty and revolutionary but they don't try to cram it full of features. And I think if you look around the smartphone and tablet world, you'll see that that's how most people try to compete with Apple is they, they add all these features in that they think Apple failed to put in there and therefore they can appeal to their certain customers. And it's, it's funny because Samsung has come along and actually become a real competitor. But before that, there was uh, what Motorola's uh, tablet, um, a few other people, and that was their tack to say, like, well, look, it costs the same as Apple's um, iPad, but it's got all these extra features in it. And mm -hmm. the bottom line was that people didn't really care about those features. They weren't, you know, Apple does what it does really, really well. So um, it is, you know, if you aim too high and try to cram it full of things, first of all, you're not going to make your deadline. And second of all, you're probably not really thinking hard enough about what people really, really want. So I think, you know, the, those extra things can come later. It's like an iPod, like Steve Jobs would even say, well, nobody wants to watch movies on an iPod. <laughs> he, would, <laughs> he would send out those signals. He maybe even believed it at the time. But then a couple of years later, it's like, hey, here's an iPod that plays movies. But it was just too much. They couldn't do that at the beginning. Now, you were the guy credited with the first in the series of iProducts as far as coming up with the name, that being iMac. Well, this is true. And it's... Uh, a humbling experience, you know, the, the power of a single character. And obviously you look back at it and realize that it was a very important moment at, at the time, of course, things never seemed quite that important. And uh, you have to keep in mind that we had nothing but computers at that time. There was no iPhone, iPod, anything like that. So there were no handheld devices, consumer electronics products. It was just, you know, Macs and Mac Pro, the kind of a thing. So we thought we were just naming a computer and that was as far as it went. I don't think at that point Steve even envisioned anything more than that. But part of the, the selling of it, and Steve did not like the name at first. It took a while to get him to like it. But part of the, the argument was that the I thing would be a good foundational name, just in case we might ever want to have another I product. <laughs> so, you know, that part looks pretty smart in retrospect. But um, it, it is only in retrospect. I don't think... Any of us are as smart as we'd like to think we were at the time when something happens. <laughs> some of it, some of it is blind luck, you know. Well, oh, I for one am glad that it won out over over the Mac Man name, which was one of the others in the run. Yeah. Um, Mac Man was the one that Steve was really digging, and that's one of those things. That you, don't you wish sometimes you could just sort of go back in time and go down different paths and see where things would have gone? But had Steve prevailed and had Mac Man been the name of the iMac, you wonder, like, what would the iPhone and iPad and those things be named? I mean, I find it hard to believe he would have kept the man designation. I don't think we'd have phone mans and pod mans. But it could be something completely different, and we'll just never know what that would have been. One of my favorite chapters in the book is the one called Think Casual, and you share some insights on 
what makes a great presentation versus what we're more likely to see often in the real world. What has working with Apple taught you about the craft and the art of presenting? Well, this is a sort of a mixed answer too, because some companies just demand that level of formality and it always, you know, sort of gets me, uh, you know, annoyed <laughs> because I remember what it was like in the days with Steve. The funniest way to explain it maybe is what happened uh, early on in my time with Next when I was working with Steve there uh, at his agency anyway. Um, and it was one of, I think it might have even been my first presentation, to be honest. He sent us off to do some newspaper ads and we came in. And at that point, I was used to working in a very formal way, the way ad agencies work with most clients. And we had a presentation. There were three ads we wanted to show them. And I had those ads face down on the conference room table. And I was going to, and I had a whole introduction ready. And um, I practiced it in, uh, in my hotel room in the morning because we'd flown out from New York to California. And it was like one of my first moments presenting to Steve. And I wanted to make sure it was absolutely great. Well, so I started to get, you know, when it came time, you know, the account guy gave a little opening speech and then it was, you know, no, Ken will take you through the ads. And so I had a little, I mean, it wasn't a long introduction. It probably only would have been a paragraph or two, but I was about one sentence into it. And Steve just, just interrupted me and said, would you turn over the damn ads? <laughs> so he didn't want like a song and dance. He said, in fact, his line was, are you going to be sitting next to me? when I read the, the Wall Street Journal in the morning to explain these things to me, um, like either they work or they don't, just turn them over, you know? So it's like, hmm, okay. So sometimes when I'm with a new client, I actually tell that little story and say, you know, so, uh, you know, in that spirit, here are the ads, and I just turn them over. <laughs> I think Steve felt that, that if you had a formal presentation, you were trying to hoodwink him into something or mm -hmm. trying to sway him with something other than the value of the thing you were talking about. So he just wanted to see the work and talk about it. And that's the way we worked with him. And I think there were a lot of times when um, uh, things would get too formal for him and he would say, you're acting like a big agency. Or if someone on his side did something, it was, you're acting like you're, you work at a big company or something. We're not IBM, we're Apple. And this is the way we work. He would not want those formal presentations. He had a whiteboard that he used a lot. And if we wanted to make a point, we would walk up to the whiteboard and we would draw something. But it was more of a pure exchange of ideas than, than any kind of, here's what we think you should do and here are all the reasons you should do it. Seems like his antenna would go up if he felt like you'd spent more time on packaging the idea than the idea itself. That's true. And I think that's actually a risk that everyone should be aware of and everywhere they go. Because, you know, if your idea is disappointing, the amount of work you put in polishing the presentation looks that much more foolish. So I think Steve really liked ideas and he didn't like the packaging of ideas uh, except of course when it came to packaging his products <laughs> and then he had a different set of standards as well but he didn't like he, yeah i think it, he used to calculate that in his head i don't know if he ever said it outright but i think he said things like that like you're spending way too much time on the presentation here not on the thinking that you're putting into it well, I believe our uh, biggest failures are often stepping stones to our greatest successes. And I'd like for you to expound, if you would, upon how Steve's exit from Apple made him better prepared for success upon his return 11 years uh, or 12 years later. Yeah, this is a very dear topic to me because I started working with, ne with Steve when he was at Next. Uh, he spent the first two years after he was thrown out of Apple starting this company, sort of conceiving it, coming up with a product concept, that kind of a thing. And it, it wasn't for about two years before he started to actually sell something. And that's when he needed an advertising agency. And at that time, I'd been working on Apple uh, being run by John Scully. I was at the agency that was doing that stuff. So I, I jumped from one agency to the next for the opportunity to work with Steve Jobs on Next. And he was a very different, well, he was the same guy, but he, he had a problem there because he just wasn't all that successful in <laughs> trying as we, as we would. But I think those years were really critical to his development because he not only started Next, but he bought Pixar and turned it into what it became. It was a real maturing process. And there are a few people out there, John Scully is one of them, saying that Steve never should have been fired. That was a mistake. I actually disagree with people who have that 
attitude. Larry Ellison's another one. He said that that was like the, the most brain dead thing he ever saw a board do. I think if it weren't for the fact that Steve went away and, and grew up um, and started a new company and learned how to get backers and partners and inspire a new set of people and not make the mistakes he had made before. And he developed this product, Next Step Software, which became vital to Apple's future success, turning into OS X. Um, all those things were just like, I don't think you could script them any better. It's, it's just perfect that Steve would go away, grow up, create new products that would become vital to Apple, come back a more mature person and do what he did from 1997 on. I, I really doubt that it would have gone that way had he stayed at Apple and, and continued to run the company down with his um, you know, somewhat immature business sense. And going back to the film for just a second, unfortunately, uh, that key period in his life gets glossed over, doesn't it? Yeah, it's, it's a very quick thing. You know, he gets, he sort of gets cast out of Apple and then you see him sort of tending his garden and then he's invited back, you know. <laughs> and there is a quick visual of Next. There's no mention of Pixar. And, um, you know, again, I think a lot of people hate that. And I think, yeah, that's a pretty serious omission. But again, you, you're dealing with two hours and you want to have some relationship stuff in there, the, the personality conflicts and stuff, and that takes time. So it's one of those painful things when you're dealing with a, a real subject because people are expecting certain things that really happen and you're trying to make a movie that fits in two hours um, and, and that gets you involved with all the character personalities and everything. Uh, it's a hard, hard thing to do. Well, well, many of us, when when met with a negative response uh, or no, uh, we just simply choose to accept it and and move on. But that's not often how it's approached uh, in Apple's case, or at least especially with Steve anyway. Yeah. It was really tough to tell Steve no. And there's a little thing, uh, a story I tell in the book about a, a project that we did involving printing an insert. And I got the best information I had. We have a producer at the agency and she talked to like Time Magazine. It was about putting a 16-page insert in the News Weekly, is that kind of thing. And the process there is that you have to print those things yourself, and then you have to have them delivered in a bunch of big tractor trailers to Time Magazine, and they they stitch them in, et cetera, et cetera. Well, they told us, you know, these are uh, commercial things. This is an editorial. So they said for that kind of purpose, they need like a lead time of like six weeks or something like that. Steve wanted it done like in two weeks, and. We said, I said, unfortunately, <laughs> that it couldn't be done. I had done my research and I talked to our producer and I, I understood the, the requirements. I said, that's just not the way they, they work on those things. And um, this is where common sense enters into it. And I would say that's one of Steve Jobs' greatest, uh, you know, unheralded skills was having, applying his common sense. But he said, that's ridiculous. 64 pages get printed every week with time. You know, they do that like with a couple of days notice because you're telling me they can't stick 16 pages in there, you know, just as fast. Um, and I said, you know, it's, yeah, I know it seems a little weird, but that's the way they handle inserts. And, you know, that's the best they can do. So he then threatened. <laughs> he said, well, if you can't do it, I'm sure I can find someone else who can do it. And that's when you think like, uh oh, <laughs> are we going to lose the account? Because, you know, we, we wouldn't do what Steve wanted to do. And then. You know, you go, I went back to the producer, told her the situation. She makes the call and time says, okay, we'll make an exception, and et cetera, et cetera. And suddenly it's down to like three weeks instead of six weeks. Mm. And, you know, all that did was prove to Steve that his common sense is, is often better than our well-considered plans. Obviously, you know, Apple struggled in Steve's absence from the mid-80s to the mid-90s. And some suggest that that's on the horizon for Apple again. But why won't Apple struggle this time without it? Well, again, I may be a contrarian here. I think an awful lot of people out there are just waiting for Apple to fail. In fact, some of them benefit by Apple failing because they become, you know, the great business analysts and they can see this coming. And there are all these stories that have been actually have been going on for years when Steve was still running the company. Um, Success breeds that. There are a lot of people just waiting for Apple to make the big mistake. So the obvious answer, um, and this is something that Larry Ellison said again the other day, um, was that without Steve, Apple is going to really go downhill. Now, I think to a degree that may be true. Um, how far downhill, I don't know. Steve was a really unique, incredibly smart, charismatic visionary, you know, <laughs> and he brought an awful lot to that 
to, to the office of the CEO that is far beyond what, what many do. Um, and his vision was certainly important and the, the way he would guide people, all of his inventors and innovators, you know, toward a vision um, that he isn't there anymore. So that cannot be the same. It has to be different. But there are plenty of examples in this world of, of companies that succeeded after the time of their founder. And I think what's important is that his values were instilled into the company and he went out of his way to do that. He um, created this thing called Apple University, where they um, try to instill the values into their executive teams. And they don't want to lose what they, you know, what drove them, the fire and the passion. So they, they try to keep that alive. And I think much as Disney did after Walt left, you know, there may be some troubling times, but overall, what Walt created still exists. It's just been adapted for a different time. And I think Apple in the coming years will run into things that Steve never imagined. So they'll have nothing to go on but the values he instilled. And um, in that sense, I, I liken it to a parent instilling values in a child and then sending him or her off into the world. You know, you, you don't know if the kid's going to even finish college or fall in with uh, drug users or, or whatever. I mean, <laughs> you lose control at a certain point, but those values are what what are left to guide a person. And I think that's the case with Apple. They have the values. Um, the executive team is well schooled in those values. I, I'm not worried right now. I'd be a little bit more worried maybe when more new people come in, but the ones who are there are very much part of, uh, you know, the Steve Jobs way of thinking. So I, I don't fear too much for their future. I, I'm concerned because Steve was such an arbiter of good taste and products and advertising and every aspect of the company. Um, and you do see some cracks uh, like in advertising, you could talk about that if you wanted. You know, Steve used to approve every single thing, and now he's not doing that anymore. And a lot of people think the stuff isn't quite as good as it used to be. And there, there may be something to that way of thinking. Um, again, it doesn't have to be the same as it was with Steve. It can still be good, um, and they can still succeed. Uh, it's just not going to be just like it was. That's an unrealistic expectation. I think success can come in different degrees, and I would expect them to continue succeeding. Well, this would be a good time to mention that the uh, the paperback edition of the book uh, has a new chapter that touches on much of this called Think Ahead. So keep that in mind as you go out and buy the book. Before we move on to a couple of other topics, uh, Ken, uh, is there anything else about the book you'd like to share that we haven't touched on? Um not so much about the book, but since you mentioned the new chapter, it does um, bring to mind one thing that I think is an important example of the kind of thing that could happen after Steve leaves. And this one's a bit touchy because it's sort of repealing something that Steve himself believed in. Um, and if you think it's a step forward, you can't help but acknowledge that maybe Steve didn't get absolutely everything right. And that is this idea um, of skeuomorphism, as it's technically called, and that is um, been a bit of a debate in the Apple world for some time now with the emergence of iOS, but it involves the use of real world imagery, like, you know, a trash can indicating garbage. And um, in the iOS, they had like, or even in the, on the Mac OS right now, they're, um, you know, if you look at the address book or the calendar, it's got like the leather and the stitching around the edges and stuff. There are a lot of people who hate that stuff. And I'm actually one of them. You know, it's, it, it just seems too funky and old to me. Like if you create a desktop calendar that looks like a, a desk blotter, I never used a desk blotter in my entire life. I don't think my dad even used one. I'm talking about my grandfather. But for some reason, they think that's, you know, a good thing. It makes people feel better about technology. So that's uh, a bit of a debate. But my point is that inside Apple, a company that always prided themselves on the integration of hardware and software. That's been a selling point from, from the very beginning, because in the PC world, you've got Microsoft making the software um, and the, the, the operating system and, and a bunch of other companies making computers. And they were never nearly as integrated as Apple was. But over the years, there came to be this divide within Apple because that debate about these skeuomorphic Elements was raging as well. Johnny Ive, the great master of design, was not in favor of, of this software design. And Scott Forstall, the guy who was behind all that stuff, loved that. And he loved it with the full support of Steve Jobs. I, I have it from good sources that Steve was 
actually the guy who loved at leather stitching and he would send people back multiple times to get every stitch correct in a very Steve Jobs like way where I look at that and go like, Oh, could we please just have like a nice metallic, you know, aluminum or something, you know, gray. Well, anyway, so Tim Cook did something that was extremely nervy. Um, he fired Scott Forstall, um, who was, you know, rubbing people the wrong way inside Apple but he had the full support of Steve previously. And without Steve, Scott uh, was vulnerable because Johnny Ive apparently didn't get along with him. Um, mm -hmm. So now Johnny Ive is the head of hardware design and software interface. So now for the first time in years, there really is a unification of hardware and software in that sense. And the experience that a customer gets is a single-minded one rather than the result of two warring parties who are trying to compromise. <laughs> so I think that was an incredible thing that, that Tim Cook did. I'm fully in, in support of it. And I think it leads Apple to a much better future. And as I said, it's, it's actually not the direction Steve would have taken. So that's a very good example of how things will change moving forward. But I think it's a positive change. Well, as a guy who has spent time working with Intel and Dell and IBM and Apple, what would you say, Ken, is the single greatest business lesson you've ever learned if you had to narrow it down to one thing? Well, when Steve passed away, I, I had to write a blog article about it just because I wanted to express my feelings. And I, I sort of posed a similar question to myself, like, wh what did I get out of working with Steve? Um, because really my time working with him on Next and Apple you know, it was by far the most meaningful time in my advertising life. I've, you know, very proud of what we accomplished and it taught me many, many things. And it may be unbelievable to some, but what I learned from Steve was the power of doing the right thing. And I know his detractors, you know, read all the stuff into his motives, but he really did want to do the right thing. He did not only in a moral sense, but in a product sense like if you you showed him you know two different paths to take and one of them cost more money and took more time but it would clearly delight customers more than than the other path he would just say what's the decision you know we got to do that and of course then he would press you to do it cheaper and faster <laughs> but um <laughs> so he wanted everything but he didn't ever compromise on things like that because he knew what the the right thing to do was and and we had some moral dilemmas too with ads running in different countries that might offend one party or another it happened in the thing different campaign. And he didn't want to like just pull things because some government complained. And, um, you know, he had this sort of moral sense of doing the right thing. And that shows up again in the app store. And a lot of people say that, you know, we hate the way Apple controls everything. And, you know, in the Android world, you can publish pretty much any app you want. And, you know, there's just a lot more freedom there. And Steve, said, you know, I appreciate that, but I, I want our environment to be safer for young people. And I want people to, um, to feel good that they know everything's going to work right. You don't have to take a chance with, with what you're downloading. And that to him was the right thing, was, was, you know, creating the best possible customer experience. And granted, it doesn't please everyone, but it pleases the kind of people who appreciate what Apple does. And that's their business model is being true to their customer and doing the right thing for them. So I, I think I saw Steve do that enough times where I, I was very impressed with the fact that he had such a uh, unshakable sense of doing the right thing, whether it was creating a better product, a better experience, or, or doing something politically that he didn't want to just like curry favor with people. He, want, people, he wanted to do the right thing. Well, before we wrap up, uh, let us know, uh, Ken, where we can find you on your website, Twitter handle if you have one, and share with us any uh, new projects coming up that uh, you want others to know about. Okay, well, uh, KenSiegel.com, and that's K-E-N-S-E-G-A-L-L. Um, that, that's sort of the entry to my little world, so you can get to my blog through there. The blog is updated pretty much weekly and try to encourage some fun conversation over there. So it's a, a bit of fun and insight and news analysis, that kind of thing, marketing and technology related. Uh, Twitter, it's uh, at K Siegel with two L's. <clears throat> and um, my current project, done a lot of work the last two years with Ron Johnson, trying to make J.C. Penny into something. That's a topic for a whole different conversation someday. Um, but I am working on my second book, so that's exciting for me. And it's uh, 
more about the implementation of simplicity. The first book sort of identifies the elements, um, but a lot of people end up thinking like, well, okay, um, so now what do we do? <laughs> so that's what the right. second book is designed to do. So hopefully in about a year's time, the publishing business you know, isn't the fastest moving one. Um, it needs to be written first, but then go through the process. So I'm in the midst of doing that. I'm very excited about it. Um, so, you know, maybe by that time I will be considered interesting enough to appear on your podcast again. <laughs> well, we would certainly love to have you back. That's for sure. And uh, I just want to say thanks for uh, taking the time out. I've enjoyed this conversation. I enjoyed the book very, very much. I found it fascinating, and I think uh, everyone should read it. Well, thank you. I uh, very much appreciate that. If you enjoyed today's episode, I hope you'll let Ken know on Twitter. Again, his Twitter handle is at K Siegel, K S E G A L L, at K Siegel on Twitter. He'd love to hear from you and get your thoughts. To comment on today's episode, you can go to the blog, read to lead podcast.com slash zero zero nine for episode nine. That's also where you'll find the links and any resources we discussed today. Uh, to leave a comment, just scroll down to the bottom and leave your comment, question, or whatever it might be. I'd also like to thank those who left a five star rating and review in iTunes since the last episode. Folks like Tony De La Rosa, Jeff Podcast Fan, Tall Mind, Ryder Leo's Dad, Tim Thompson, Jerry Walker, Alan Dubon of alandubon.com, and Jerry Thomas. If you'd like to leave a five-star rating or review, you can do so by going to readtoleadpodcast.com slash iTunes. That's readtoleadpodcast.com slash iTunes. And I'll be sure and mention your name on a future episode of the Read to Lead podcast. That's it for this episode. I look forward to seeing you next time. Thanks so much for listening to the Read to Lead podcast. As a subscriber, we challenge you to be more than just a passive listener. Become a vital member of the community. Visit us on the web at readtoleadpodcast.com and chat with other members at facebook.com slash readtoleadnation. Until next time, remember, leaders read and readers lead.